is a little known fact that a century ago it was wounded soldiers rather than famous celebrities getting the latest plastic surgery. The First World War saw a huge rise in the number of drastic facial injuries. Surgeon Harold Gillies developed a new method of facial reconstructive surgery in 1917. His work marked the dawn of plastic surgery as we know it today. Until the First World War, most battle injuries were caused by small arms fire or sword cuts. Facial injuries were often of little concern to survivors who were deemed lucky enough to have escaped with their lives. But weapons used during the First World War like heavy artillery, machine guns and poison gas created injuries of severity and scale unseen before. The circumstances of trench warfare caused a dramatic rise in the number of facial injuries sustained by soldiers. Shells filled with shrapnel were to be blamed for many of these facial and head wounds, as they were specifically designed to cause maximum damage. Hot flying metal could tear through flesh to create twisted, ragged wounds or even rip faces off entirely. Facial injuries were not easily treated on the front line. As the scars healed, the flesh tightened, pulling the face into a hideous grimace. Jaw injuries could leave men unable to eat or drink. Some men were blinded or left with a gaping hole where their nose used to be. Harold Gillies was a New Zealand surgeon who had trained in England. Posted to France in 1915, he witnessed the rise in horrific facial wounds inflicted by this new style of warfare. On his return to England, Gillies set up a special ward for facial wounds at the Cambridge Military Hospital in Aldershot. He even sent his own casualty labors to the field hospitals in France to make sure that men with such injuries were sent directly to him. By 1916, Gillies had persuaded his medical chiefs that a dedicated hospital for facial injuries was required to meet the demand. Gillies established the Queen's Hospital in 1917. It was the world's first ever hospital dedicated to treatment of facial injuries. The aim of the Queen's Hospital was to reconstruct wounded men's faces as fully as possible so they could hopefully lead a normal life. Many patients lived in fear of what their loved ones would say when they saw how badly disfigured they were. Gillies knew that healthy tissue needed to be moved back to its normal position. After this, any gaps could be filled with tissue from elsewhere on the body. Surgeons already had a degree of experience with skin grafts. And after the work had been completed on the bone structure of the man's face, they were ready to reconstruct the soft tissues. This pioneering work by Gillies and his team marked a huge advance in reconstructing the faces of severely injured men. It also laid the foundations of modern plastic surgery. The New Zealand Medical Corps Facial and Jaw Injury Unit, led by Henry Pickerill, transferred to the same location in 1918. Pickerill himself treated over 200 men and became a renowned plastic surgeon. He developed teaching models 
to demonstrate the rapidly changing methods of facial reconstructive surgery. Thousands of men suffered long-term disabilities as a result of the First World War. Improvements in plastic surgery and facial reconstruction techniques brought them some relief. But many were left to fend for themselves with little financial or social support from the state. Gillies recognized that the disfigured men had treated would be disadvantaged in the job market, so he introduced training schemes to give them interests and new skills. His patients responded to their injuries in different ways. Many went home grateful and happy with the work he had done for them, but some men never left the Queen's Hospital, unwilling to present themselves to a curious and sometimes hostile world. Today, Gillies is often referred to as the father of plastic surgery. Many of the techniques he developed during the First World War are still used in modern reconstructive surgeries. The concept of cosmetic surgery also emerged as a result of Gilly's work. His desire to restore normal appearance as well as functionality was revolutionary. For the first time, patients could choose the nose or jaw their doctors would build for them. Even so, the surgery Gilly's patients received was born of necessity. Their situation was a far cry from the purely cosmetic facelifts and nose jobs we see today.